Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 513 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's show is called Break in the Clouds, and my guest is Sarah. Now, I lost the first four minutes of this episode. I'm sorry. I don't know how it happened. But uh, let me give you the quick overview. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Scott. So you have type 1 diabetes? Yeah. How old are you? I'm in college. Okay. That was pretty much it. Uh, You'll be able to enjoy the rest of the episode now. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. I'd like to remind you that if you're looking for the diabetes pro tip or the defining diabetes series, you could look at diabetespro-tip.com. They're also available through juiceboxpodcast.com and right there in your podcast player. All right, a little more business, and then we get right to Sarah. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Omnipod. Find out more about the Omnipod Dash and all of the Omnipod products at omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Later in the show, I'm going to tell you about the Omnipod Promise. The show is also sponsored today by the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. I have never used a more accurate meter. I have never held a more comfortable meter. It is wonderful. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. I clicked on the wrong button just now Uh and cut Sarah off for everybody listening. So this is going to feel like a really awkward edit, but, uh, (laughs) I asked Sarah this question already. She started to answer and I messed up. So, hey, Sarah, (laughs) do you think either of your parents had anxiety? I think that my dad might have had a little anxiety in the same sense I do. Um, He has what my mom calls like white coat coat syndrome, Mm -hmm. where he gets really nervous to go to doctors, get a flu shot. He just is not into all that. So the fact that oh, your child was just diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and you're going to have to give her insulin shots every day. Every day you're going to have to check her blood sugar with this little poker thing. And I think he just kind of shut down after that, whereas my mom was more like the champion for me. She wanted to put me into clubs and get out there. Sarah. There. Oh, sorry. So you, you, it's you, interesting you. that they were both kind of on opposite ends of that. Well, you know, it's interesting. You said white coat syndrome, actually, because that's mm-hmm. a, a very real thing, but it's got a, a, mm-hmm. a finite um, definition, but I think of it as a little larger around diabetes. So the real definition of it is uh, it's like, it's like a form of hypertension. So people mm-hmm. um, have like a normal blood pressure and then they go into a clinical setting and have their blood pressure checked and it's crazy high. But it, it's not in the rest of their life, as far as anyone can tell. They just, they see the white coat and they get nervous. Maybe mm-hmm. it's nervous about being around a doctor or that you're about to be tested and you don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what happens to people. But I, I always, in my mind, expand that around diabetes to think about, you know, you see so many people, or I talk to so many people who are so confident about their diabetes and they know what they're doing. And they're afraid to tell their doctor that they changed their basal rate. Where they're afraid to, th- you know, they're afraid. The doctor's like, everything looks great, you know, and yeah. and they're thinking it's not. I missed all my bolus, but I corrected it, so you can't see it here, you know. And they won't tell them. And um, I think of that as more of like the diabetes white coat, but it's, mm-hmm. it's very interesting. So your dad's a nervous guy. Yeah, that's the way they think and, of it. And it's it's lovable about him. He definitely wants to be as helpful as he can, but uh, like not having any diabetes in my family it definitely was a big adjustment Mm -hmm. and I'm the same way as my dad in the sense that we really hate change so I'm glad that I was in a way I'm I'm lucky that I was young diagnosed with diabetes so I didn't have to deal with that (laughs) so you don't in your mind connect anxiety and diabetes you don't see it as I have anxiety because of my diabetes you just didn't you you have these two separate things yes but 
um, the diabetes definitely doesn't help my anxiety sometimes. I like imagine. for me, I'll get, um, I've been a lot better recently and like, it's kind of crazy that my anxiety has gotten better during a pandemic, <laughs> but it's the truth. I've been able to manage my diabetes even better over this year. Um, whereas my anxiety would, it would make me so overwhelmed that it got to the point where I was checking my number maybe twice a day. This was before my CGM. This mm-hmm. is when I was still using um, a manual um, checker. Uh, what are they called? Sorry. I've a blood the word, glucose but, meter. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, I would check when I woke up and kind of after I did my homework and was about to go to bed. And that was the point where I was in my lowest with anxiety. And, and I would say I kind of suffered with a little bit of depression as well mm-hmm. um, without putting a name to it in high school. Um, it was it was really interesting because I kind of had that diabetes white coat syndrome where I was feeling kind of ashamed to go see my endocrinologist every three months because I, I, I got that anxiety that, oh, my appointment's coming up. I need to be on top of my diabetes more. And it just, it was at the point where I just did not put that effort into my diabetes management. So I would feel so bad about myself because my A1Cs were reflecting that. My A1Cs were pretty high for my age and for my age and it was something that I was just ashamed of and it it was just really hard. Does the does the um anxiety breed procrastination? Because if you procrastinate, you don't have to deal with a thing that makes you anxious. But then I, doesn't that yeah, make you anxious? Um for me, it's kind of interesting. I pride myself in being a, a really good student. Mm-hmm. So being in college and um, I would prioritize schoolwork over my diabetes, if that makes sense. Like I would avoid the pressure of the diabetes anxiety and deal with the anxiety I had over college, okay. which was not a great idea, but it was something that I did to cope if that makes sense. You just felt like you had enough bandwidth for one of these things and you chose school. Yes. Mm -hmm. What would happen when you ignored your diabetes? You're just talking about higher blood sugars, but you weren't checking anyway, so you wouldn't know if they were high or not, right? Right. So it was kind of scary, actually. My numbers would be, like when I got around to checking them, my numbers would be, uh, I'll just throw out a number, they would be in the 300s, Mm -hmm. low 300s, and I wouldn't feel that. And that's when I realized, like, I used to be able to feel when my numbers were going high and I used to be able to feel when they were going low, but it got to the point where I kind of just felt the same all day if I was 110 or 310. So did you, I'm sorry, did you used to play that game when you were younger? Like I feel myself getting higher. I'll give myself some insulin. I would check my numbers and then I would be, oh, I was right. And then I kind of got that confidence like oh I know I'm low right now because I feel shaky I feel like a headache and I would check my numbers back then and then when I got more independent with diabetes when I didn't have to call my parents every day from the clinic Mm -hmm. um, I would be like oh I'll just skip checking my number at lunch because I feel fine I don't feel low I don't feel high but what happened was my numbers would steadily be high and you so didn't, it was pretty bad. Yeah, you didn't recognize that your body had lost the ability to feel the difference anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can still feel when I'm low for some reason, but I think my body just got used to the, the high. higher blood sugars, which That's, is scary. That's what it does. Your body is trying its best to adapt and keep you alive as long as it can. Mm-hmm. That really is what it's trying for. So something starts going wrong and it does its best to keep you alive. Um, Whether it's you cut your leg and don't touch it and, you know, it it tries to clot, you know, it's still going to get infected, Mm -hmm. right? But it's going to try to buy you another hour, another minute, another day for you to figure out how to save yourself. And Mm -hmm. it's cool. It sounds like you figured it out. Um, Yeah, I'm so glad that I finally got the CGM because that was another thing. I was anxious 
to get a CGM because I was feeling like, oh, I'll just be this robot person with an insulin pump and this thing on my arm. And people are going to think that I like no one's going to think I'm weird. And it was like such silly thoughts of mm-hmm. anxiety. But that's what it does to you. It, it makes you feel just so low, I guess. Um, and so now that I feel pride in having diabetes and that I can teach people about it and I'm a nanny so I told I even show the kids that I nanny my little pu- robot machine I call it a robot machine because they think it's the coolest thing that Miss Sarah has this cool button on her arm and this cool little robot machine that she keeps in her pocket and That's it's cool. made me feel a lot better about that and I'm so glad that I have the CGM now yeah, I'm, because I'm, I can check my number and make it kind of fun for people around me too. I'm glad if, I'm glad for you as well, but I have a question. So you said you had mm-hmm. a lot of like worries, like, Oh, I'm going to look like, you know, a machine, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever worry? My blood sugar is really high. I'm going to kill myself. No. Isn't that interesting? And it's, it's, it's scary to think, think about because I wouldn't care if my number was, Hi, I would just be like, oh, okay, I just have to put some insulin in and I'll go to bed. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't taking care of myself in that way. So it was really bad. It just, and I don't mean you specifically, mm-hmm. but I just think it's incredibly interesting how our minds work. Very. Yeah. You, you know, you're like, well, I don't want this thing on me. That is going to be a large problem. Yes. Not having it might be causing me to you know, have significant health concerns and, and, mm-hmm. and pass earlier than I, I should or need to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not, even in an anxious person, that your anxiety didn't train you on that idea and make you worry about that. Is, mm-hmm. I find that fascinating. It really is. And I had plenty of arguments with my mom about it because she had wanted me to get it since I was first available to have with CGM. Um, and I just was so stubborn and just worried about that instead of the real problem of managing my diabetes. Yeah. How long, how many years do you think you were in that space where you weren't really managing well and, and your A1C you said was high, but you didn't put a number on it, but. Oh, so it got to about, it was like in the nines Okay. for about a year and I was doing the, I wasn't really managing for about two years at the end of high school and the beginning of college. Gotcha. For me. When you kind of mm-hmm. translated away from your translate is not the right word. When you, what's the word I want? Transitioned. Oh my God, mm-hmm. Sarah, you couldn't think of a word earlier. And now I'm can't <laughs> at it. So when you kind of transitioned away from your family management and into that later high school college time, mm-hmm. so you maybe only had maybe two or three years in there where you just weren't really on top of it. Did they think mm-hmm. you were? Like, didn't your yeah, parents see the A1C so. go up, though? So I would go, I would. I started going to my endocrinologist appointments by myself. Mm-hmm. So that was an easy way out for me to be like, oh, yeah, my A1C was good. Um, Shannon, who's my nurse practitioner, um, she was always so helpful with me. But I would just kind of. It was kind of like in one year out the other for a while. Mm -hmm. I kind of just avoided the change because I didn't think that I could manage it well. But it's not the truth. Everybody can manage it. It's just the fact of motivating yourself to do it, I believe. Let me ask you, you, did you feel like you couldn't do it without your parents, but you were supposed to do it without them? I don't know if it was that I couldn't do it necessarily, but it was just the change of going from my mom and dad over my shoulder all day to being independent and having to not having to manage it by myself, but I kind of chose to, because I was just <clears throat> tired of it, I guess. And I, it felt like it honestly felt kind of like a break from diabetes. I think that's where it comes from is like, I was just so overwhelmed with everything a normal high schooler goes through and then having diabetes on top of that, I was just like ready for a, kind of an escape from it. I have to tell you that where I grew up, we called this, um, uh, we didn't have a name for it, but uh, it was something <laughs> that we recognized about girls who went to Catholic school their whole lives. <laughs> like they would graduate from high school and do something drastic. Right. You know what I mean? They'd start, they'd cut their hair oddly or <laughs> date a guy they would never date 
or, Mm -hmm. you know, some girls became really promiscuous. It's, It's just like, which I don't even like that word because I don't think of it as that I just mean they just mm-hmm. like, Sarah. What I mean is they right. started banging a lot. Is what I'm saying. I don't. I, you, mm-hmm. I, I don't have a judgment. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a judgment about it. Like like what it means. Right. Um. But they would just break from whatever. I always thought of it as they they were being forced to stay in a cocoon, mm-hmm. and so that they didn't get let out slowly. It was just like, uh, hey boys, I'm here. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it just all at once, kind of a thing, and a run towards whatever wasn't their norm. Mm-hmm. Um. And I wonder if, you know, you're, you're, you you talked about school being important to you. Mm-hmm. You sound like you live in the Virginia-ish area. So mm-hmm. it sounds like you're, um, you probably have a, you're probably uh, like a real firm respect for your parents, not wanting to let them down, that whole thing. I'm about right about that, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I'm the first person actually in my family to go to college. Wow. So I think that's another factor of that I really want to get this degree and make myself proud and my parents. So I think I was very focused on that. And I just let that kind of be my priority. And I wonder if the doing things like that as you're growing up, I'm now talking about everybody, not just you, but I wonder if the doing Mm -hmm. things as you're growing up because you're supposed to, instead of because you want to, doesn't leave you with that feeling of, I have to get away from this. And the very first minute you have the opportunity, you escape it somehow. And it sounds to me like your drive to be a good student, you had more stressors to do that than you did to take care of your diabetes. So you just, you, that's the one you chose. Right. It's I also, kind of put the diabetes on the back burner. Mm-hmm. And, um, you're, and you're a good student too, right? Mm-hmm. So it right. makes it easier. Like you can gravitate towards the thing you know you're going to succeed at when you run towards one of them. Exactly. I don't know if I'm right about that. I could be a hundred percent wrong, uh, <laughs> but it, it's why while we've been raising our children, we've tried really, really hard to mix what we want and hope for them with who they are mm-hmm. instead of just saying, this is what you're supposed to do. Do this. And it's hard as a parent yeah. sometimes when you're like, oh, I really do wish this is the path they were on but it's not right for them. I, I shouldn't force them onto that path, mm-hmm. you know, but, but, you know, good news. You figured it out, right? What, yeah. <laughs> what, what, put, what pushed you over the edge? Like, what got you thinking about it differently? Um, honestly, I was just one day I was like, wait, I don't want to die when I'm like 50 or forties, you know, like I don't want to let diabetes control me anymore Mm -hmm. I was so scared and anxious for a long time that well diabetes it's different every single day what is the point of trying to fix my numbers trying to adjust my basils and trying to get the CGM to see how my trends are going and one day I was just like okay this is enough I am going to college to get a degree to have a career but I'm not taking taking care of my health, what's the point of like one or the other? I need to do both. I think it was just like one day I just was like, this isn't healthy and I need to be healthy. And the it di- was just kind of a, yeah. Yeah. And the diabetes sounds like it, it, <clears throat> it impacted your goal. Like it finally mm-hmm. was a, a prohibitive thing to you because you had the conscious thought, why am I planning for a future that I can't have. Right. Right. I need to make sure my health is there so that this future I'm putting together for myself is, isn't full of health issues or, or maybe shorter than I, than I want it to be. That's really, yeah, really interesting that you came to it so quickly. Did you have a, like, if, do you, do you feel like you still have some depression or is it just the, the anxiety now? Um, I think it comes and goes. It's not, major anymore Mm -hmm. I think for about a year and a half I was really low at a low point but I was functioning like I had high functioning anxiety and depression and I'm blessed to be able to see a therapist and I'm blessed to be able to have a consistent job that keeps me out of that dark place and having a therapist I think I my opinion is everyone with diabetes should seek a therapist because it has helped me extremely like I can't even put it into words because I felt for so long like a burden 
on my parents financially because diabetes is not cheap. It's an expensive disease. And that's another part of it, becoming independent and paying for my CGMs myself and deciding to take my, my diabetes care into my own hands has helped me realize that it's just something that I, I can make it. I can get out of this dark place and I can manage my diabetes the way I want to. That's cool. Mm-hmm. It even sounds like the idea of taking over financial responsibility alleviates you from the strain of feeling like you're stressing your parents financially. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's yes. even been valuable for you. I, I was just trying to decide, like, where did you find that, like, spot of sunshine in a cloudy day where you could, like, <laughs> stop and think, I need to do better with my blood sugars because I want to live a full life. Like, you you just got, mm-hmm. I guess you just got lucky, right? You had a you had a moment where it all just made yeah. sense. So, honestly, the, we're in a global pandemic right now, but it has helped me figure out what I want to do. So uh, for so long, I wanted to be a teacher. I still do want to be a teacher, but that, that kind of sunlight that you're talking about is when I figured out, Hey, why can't I teach about diabetes? Why can't I go that route of it? So I've focused on becoming a diabetes educator. And that's something that I've had a newfound passion for this year. And I think that's another point part of it um, because I'm really excited about that. And because of struggling with anxiety and some depression about in, in my life and it kind of regards diabetes, I think that I'll have a really good viewpoint for people to help them. Yeah. I bet you will. That's excellent. Well, cool. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> did you find that having access to your blood sugars more regularly through a continuous glucose monitor, um, that changed your ability to manage? Like, like, what would you tell me your A1C is now? Oh, my last A1C was, um, it was eight point something. So we're slowly coming down, slowly getting down. Yes. Gotcha. And I've been able to, I have a freestyle Libre, mm-hmm. um, and I love it. Um, I can see on my app and I scan it with my phone every day. And it's just pretty cool to like see it in the green. It has like a green graph. And when you go low, it goes red. And when you go high, it goes orange. Like, you know, um, and it's just pretty cool to visibly see my graphs every day because then I have been able to focus on a specific time of day where like I was waking up with really high blood sugars in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like researching that and finding out about like the morning phenomenon where you're sometimes but people's blood sugar spike in the morning, like when they wake up, um, that has been really, it's kind of fun for me to be watching my numbers throughout the day. And that's actually really helped my anxiety to be able to get like a, see it as a whole day instead of thinking like, oh, my number's high right now. Let me go be, like, think about it for hours like oh my number's super super high what do i do what do i do and being able to see it go down steadily on a graph has helped me i don't know if that makes sense no, it but does it makes it seeing it has really helped it makes it aspirational it makes it something yes. that you feel like you can affect because yeah. you can see cause and effect you can see you know i did this and then this happened or i could do more next time or i could do it mm-hmm. sooner you know you start really figuring out how to use the insulin. Cause Sarah, that's really where you're at now. It's interesting as you're talking, you're mm-hmm. basically in year one of diabetes right now. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. It's not. It happens to a lot of people. It, it really does. I've spoken to so many people who figure these things out at all different times of their life mm-hmm. with diabetes. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I spoke with a woman once who was a mother and uh, she was a single mom. She had a bunch of kids. She was in her late 30s, and she said that the podcast helped her figure out that, you know, what was going on. But she had had diabetes since she was like 16. Wow. And she had never fundamentally understood it. And this is where you are. It's like Mm -hmm. you just got diagnosed and someone explained it to you correctly, and now now you're starting to figure it out. How Do you listen to the show? 
Yeah, so I first found your show by accident on Spotify no. um, over the summer. So I would say maybe like May or June is when I first listened. And I was scrolling because you have so many episodes and it was like, oh my gosh, where, why have I never heard of this before? So I really like took a deep dive into your show and listened to like a lot of podcasts about people who are about my age and um with anxiety or like depression episodes especially Mm -hmm. and and it really helped me figure out like oh there's other people that struggle with this and I can change this and it's another interesting thing is I have two close friends that have type 1 diabetes we met in high school in the clinic in the nurse's office um and we've become really close friends because of diabetes but it was almost like I had more pressure on me to manage better because they would always tell me how great they're doing with diabetes. And I was kind of sitting there like, oh, my number has been in the 200s all day, but I wouldn't say that. I just kind of felt that secret shame. Yeah. So you're, you're illuminating something that I've long believed is that there's, um, always been sort of this vein in diabetes in the diabetes space. Like you don't talk about doing well, because it makes other people feel bad in the exact Mm -hmm. same way that you just explained. Mm -hmm. I've always thought, why don't we talk about doing well and show somebody how to do well at the same time, right? Because if those people would have said to you, hey, my blood sugar is 89, what's yours? Mm -hmm. And you said 200 and they said, oh, that's okay. Here's the super easy secret how to fix that. You would have been like, oh, cool, thanks. And and that would have been the end of it, except they didn't know why they were doing better than you. And by the way, mm-hmm. you, you were a little kid. You might have had a 200 right. blood sugar. They might have had 160 blood sugar. And you were like, oh, my God, they're killing it. And, you know, maybe they really weren't. So right. it, it's all perspective. But I understand that feeling of, like, seeing somebody do better than you and just shutting down because it's embarrassing to say mm-hmm. what's going on with you. But I think – in my opinion, unless you found them already, you're ready to jump to episode 210 and listen to the pro tip series. Okay. And that's going to help you figure out how to use your insulin better. I would honestly tell you, if you listen through the pro tip episodes, I would guess your A1C would be in the sixes in like three or four months. Wow. <laughs> I think I think it could. I think you just don't fundamentally yet know how to manage your insulin. You're right. And yeah. I think for a while not really understanding exactly what my disease was um was hard for me because being diagnosed so young it kind of was like managed for me for so long and like we've been talking about the new independence of diabetes and I'm kind of on I'm starting over basically with management okay yeah no I think that I mean it doesn't have to be difficult um but it is if you don't have the tools and the tool the tools are ideas right they're concepts and i'm talking to you now for 40 minutes you're a bright person you're motivated uh there's no reason why you couldn't take these easy to to use ideas and put them into practice and i could even if you want i'll walk through a couple of them with you right now um i honestly do would you are you up for that or yeah, that'd be awesome. Cool. Okay. So Sarah, here we go. Ready? <laughs> First of all, if your basal insulin isn't right. Hey, before I get to the ads, I want to let you know that I got an update from Sarah and I'm going to read it to you at the end of the episode. For now, I'd like to tell you that the Contour Next One blood glucose meter is my preferred meter as a person who tests people's blood sugar. It's my daughter's preferred meter because it fits really well in her pocket and in her bag, and it's super accurate, and the light is bright. It's easy to use. You know what else she likes about it? Second chance test trips. Being able to touch the blood, not get quite enough, and go back and get more. Now, that shouldn't confuse you into thinking that the Contour needs a giant blood drop. It does not. Just saying, you know those times where you're like, I got, I, this is enough. Like you're squeezing and it's not, and you're like, this, and you talk yourself into believing it's enough blood and it's not. In those moments, you can touch the test strip, find out it's not enough, get a little more, go back again without impacting adversely the accuracy of your blood test. 
or ruining a strip. The Contour Next One meter is amazing and it's worth checking out. They have a great website, contournext.com forward slash juice box. Ton of information there, uh, all kinds of stuff you might find out. You might find out that you're eligible for a free meter. You may find out that buying the test strips in cash is cheaper than what you're paying through your insurance. That'd be crazy, right? Anyway, ton of good information on a really well-made website. It's easy to navigate, easy to understand. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Links in the show notes. A links at juiceboxpodcast.com. Now I'd like to tell you about some more exciting news. You can get a free 30-day Omnipod Dash trial if you're eligible at omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Now you may be thinking, mm, yeah, Scott, I'm waiting for that next big thing before I jump in. Well, guess what? There's no need to wait for the next big thing because with the Omnipod promise, you can upgrade to Omnipod's latest technologies for no additional cost as soon as they are available to you and covered by your insurance. Terms and conditions apply, but you can find out all of the details at Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Head over there right now and you can get started tubeless insulin pumping right away. And my gosh, if you're eligible for that free trial, that's 30 free days of an insulin pump. You get to use the dash for 30 days for the free. Definitely worth checking out, especially now, um, you know, summertime, get outside, be a great time to give it a whirl. I do want to say this. Say you get the dash. Oh, and you'll love it. But then something else comes out and you're like, oh, I wish I had that. Just get that. It's that easy. That's the Omnipod promise. Now, if you stay with the dash forever and ever, here's what you're getting. Tubeless insulin pump. Fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. My daughter has been using the Omnipod since she was four years old and she turned 17 the other day. Arden has been wearing an Omnipod every day for all of those years. It is an absolute friend in this journey to us and to my daughter. And I think you may find something similar with your experience. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com. Please consider supporting the sponsors. All right, let's get back to Sarah. If your basal insulin isn't right, everything else isn't going to work, okay? And by Mm -hmm. right, I mean away from food, away from other influencers, is your basal insulin holding your blood sugar steady at a number near 90? Is it? Um, I've recently changed it, and we're seeing that it's come down a lot. It's not around 90, but it's definitely lower than it used to be. Okay. So let's just say, I don't know where it is now, but let's say it's at 150 and you're Mm -hmm. thinking, oh, that's great because I used to find stability at 200. So that's right. You're right. Mm -hmm. But more basal, like keep moving your basal up until it holds you stable and steady at a number that you're happy with. Okay. For, For me, I mean, we're shooting for like 85 with my daughter, but, you know, let's say you could just try for 100 for now. But the Mm -hmm. point is, is that if your basal is well dialed in, if you understand how to pre-bolus your meals and you're pretty good at counting your carbs or more accurately understanding the impact that carbs have on you, you're going to have an A1C in the sixes and you're not going to have a lot of lows. And you're not going to spike high. And and so that's sort of the next thing, right? So first is basil. Mm-hmm. The second is you have to pre-bolus your meals. So do you pre-bolus your meals? I tend to bolus like as I'm sitting down with my food. <laughs> Don't worry. I already knew that when you told me your A1C. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so now the next thing to do is you get your basil right. And then you learn your pre-bolus time. And you can do that easily by getting stable somewhere away from food, like a few hours removed from food or insulin, find yourself stable anywhere. Say you're stable to 150. Put in a bolus that you think will move you from 150 to 90 
and see how long it takes for that bolus mm-hmm. to begin working. That amount of time is about your pre-bolus time. And now let's say that ends up being 15 minutes. Now you start bolusing your meals 15 minutes before you eat them. That stops the big spike, right? And Mm -hmm. it also keeps you from getting low after meals because I'm also going to guess that you get low after you eat and have to retreat with food and then get high again. Does that happen? It happens sometimes, but actually it happens. What tends to happen is I'll kind of stay the same blood sugar. Ah, so you're Mm -hmm. going up and staying up. Mm -hmm. So you're not using enough insulin and you need a pre right so it, and so we're changing that we're trying to the insulin sensitivity has been a struggle for me the idea of how far a unit moves your blood sugar mm-hmm. okay well so if your basal's wrong it's going to be hard to figure that out so yeah imagine if the basal insulin i'm going to make up numbers here but imagine your basal insulin is at a unit an hour, just a nice round number. And it really should be, I don't know, a unit and a quarter an hour. So that means that every hour that you're awake, your basal insulin is deficient by a quarter. So every four hours, you're missing a unit. Or mm-hmm. four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, you're missing six, is that right? Six units of basal a day. And so if you had that insulin in your basal, your blood sugar would be lower and it would be easier to impact a blood sugar with a correction. So saying that, you know, your insulin sensitivity is um, a unit for 50 points, but your basal's off by 20 or 40%, Mm -hmm. that's not accurate. So it's basal first, then pre-bolus, then really understanding your meals and your food. And by that, Mm -hmm. I just mean really having a firm grasp of the glycemic load and glycemic index of foods, meaning that 10 carbs worth of watermelon is not going to move your blood sugar as far or need as much insulin as 10 carbs of white rice. Right. Right. And once Mm -hmm. you have that down and you can start making better decisions about your meals, those are the three, those are the cornerstones to me. Mm. Of course, if there was one more, I would actually have a cornerstone, but let's call them a triangle stones. Uh, those, <laughs> those are the three ideas. Basil, pre-bolus, really getting the amount of insulin you need for your meal down. After that, you branch off into what protein and fat do to like later rises after you've eaten and understanding stuff like that. But honestly, yeah. that's that's the base of it right there, in my opinion. Does that all make sense to you? Yeah, it's great. And I mean, it's something that is definitely going to take time. And I know it's not easy. It's easier said than done. But I'm very hopeful. I agree. And I don't agree. Okay, so what I'll say is, if you came here today and said to me, hey, Scott, here's my Libre controller and my pump. About four hours from now, I could have your blood sugar stable at 85. Mm -hmm. And then we'd know your basal was right. Then we could figure out your pre-bolus and move on. It's it's hard because you don't have all the tools, like the knowledge. And I mean knowledge when I say tools, Mm -hmm. to do the thing. So it seems like every idea is just a – it probably feels like you're just throwing darts with your eyes closed, right? (laughs) Right? Like you're guessing. Like maybe this is where I turn up – Tell me this, your basal profile, is it one basal insulin all day or do you have a whole bunch of different segments? I have, on my pump, It's it goes by like a few hours at a time mm-hmm. is a different basal. So like the morning is different than um, like lunchtime and then the afternoon and then like dinner time and then overnight. So I would tell you to consider that it's possible that because these all these ideas are kind of mismatched Mm -hmm. that you're creating high and low segments during the day, thinking that they're uh, organic, that they're just happening and that you're trying to move the basal around to stop them. So you, you have a feeling like I always get low between two and four in the afternoon. So we'll turn my basal down. Mm -hmm. And what I'll tell you is that the first time of any 24 hour period that your basal's wrong. If it's too weak, 
you're going to get higher later. Eventually, you're going to bolus at that high number, which is going to make you lower later. If you get in the same pattern over and over again, you can fool yourself into believing, I'm always low at 9 p.m. When the truth is, you're using too much insulin for your dinner at 6 p.m. And I'm making stuff up now. But, you know, like, that's the idea. So that's why I'm saying basal, pre-bolus. So the basal keeps things stable. The pre-bolus stops the spikes. Not having the spikes stops the corrections. When you stop the corrections all the time, you're stopping insulin from being active once the food's out of your system. Now you're not having lows, etc. Or you're using enough insulin at your meals, which is stopping a high, you know, and now you're sitting higher than you want to be forever waiting for it to come down. And the truth is, if a high blood sugar comes down on its own three and four and five hours later, that could mean your basil's too strong at that point. So it's it's it. I know it seems super complicated, but I would tell you, seriously, try the pro tip episodes. I bet you they would mm-hmm. help you. And I want you to let me know if they do, too. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it sounds really great. Cool. That's excellent. Well, tell me um, a little bit about your plans um, after college. So what do you have to do to become a diabetes educator? So I'm not sure if it's different for different states, but at least in Virginia, there's a few different um, routes that I can take. I can become just a nurse, straight up nurse. I can become a nutritionist or a dietitian or even an optometrist to get into an exam, to sit for an exam, to become a certified diabetes educator. Mm -hmm. So I'm still in the process of deciding Um, which way I want to go with that because right now my program is teaching and I'm going to graduate with my associate's degree um, in the spring semester. Excellent. So I'm focused on finishing that first, but fortunately for me, a lot of the classes that I've already taken are like prerequisites for the nursing program. So that's kind of where I'm leaning towards. Nice. Do you like being around people and working with people? I love it. Cool. Mm-hmm. That's a good spot for you then. Um, yeah, there's some people who try to become nurses and they're not people, pe- people, <laughs> persons, persons, people's people, persons. What is the, fr- what are you? You're a people person. Ah, people they're, person. They're not a people person. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm kind of an introverted person, whereas I like my time to recharge. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how it goes. Being a nanny is, is, is interesting. Um, but I'm really blessed insight. to be able to work. Yeah, no kidding. Mm-hmm. So being introverted, does that mean that when you're around other people, um, projecting an image that you think people want to see in a social setting drains you? No, I think it's more of I prefer smaller groups. Like I love to be around people, but when it becomes like bigger groups, like more than like five people, I'm just kind of like, oh, I can't really talk to all of you and like keep a conversation going, but maybe I'll just talk to one person. Mm-hmm. So that in that kind of way. That's interesting. When there are a lot of people, they all seem like individuals that need attention. Like you, you can't see people as background. Mm-hmm. Well, yes and no. So I like to, well, before the pandemic at like a party for example, I would stick to like my group of friends, but I mean, that's normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm not sure how to explain that, but yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know either. I was just, I'm interested because I'm imagining myself in a group of like many, many people. And I feel like I just see the sea of people a around crowd. me as mm-hmm. just a blur of nothing. You know what I mean? Like I don't focus yeah. on them. They're, they could be there or not be there. Um, I don't love gatherings like that either just so you know i'm not i'm not oh, yeah it's, it's not my favorite either <laughs> i don't know a lot of people who love to be around you know a hundred screaming people mm-hmm. it's not a lot of fun uh for me at least well okay is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to talk about i just wanted to mention like as we're going over the pro tips and things like mm-hmm. i love all of the advice and i really appreciate it but it's important to remember for people with diabetes and anxiety like it is manageable but it just takes a little bit more um what's the word I guess motivation for some people it could be 
people with depression, it just takes a little bit more motivation to change these things. So I'm in a good place right now where I can look at the three points you gave me and I'm really excited to try this. But if you talk to me a year or two years ago, I would have just been like, okay, that sounds great, but I don't think I'll be doing that right now. Like if, does that make sense? No, like it's it important does. to remember that it's going to, it's going to work out, but it just, each person is different and I totally respect that. And I just want to make sure that that's no, someone, I'm... everybody listening can still remember because yeah. I was definitely in the place where advice was more. So I was, I was taking advice as insults in the past and now I'm super excited about advice and diabetes because I have that newfound hope for it. And, oh, that's interesting. So advice felt like an insult. Meaning at some points, yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, hey, you know what you could do? You could get up and go for a walk and that would be good for you. And you're like, I know right. I'm and lazy. Like, and that's how it felt, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's an it's attack. Like, I know a lot of people out there have anxiety and depression, but for people like my boyfriend, who is an amazing support system and all my friends, but I'm one of the only people in my in my, I guess, bubble in my group that suffer with depression and anxiety as intense as I did so for a while it was hard to even reach out to be like hey I'm struggling mm -hmm. and I and and sometimes it was just like well why don't you go do this like you said and I think some it's important to remember that it's going to be okay yeah. we just have to yeah no it's interesting because you found part of the podcast where it was people talking and that made you feel like you're not alone and that, mm -hmm. and that was helpful. But I think if I'm not wrong, what you're saying is that if you're anxious or depressed, that the process is going to take longer, right? Because right. you, you kind of have to make yourself right with a step and then move to the next one. And that mm -hmm. even just saying, hey, you know, it's basal, pre-bolus, this, this is where you start, that could seem overwhelming to somebody. Exactly. Right? Because it's, even though it's, we, as you were discussing it, you were like, one, two, three, three points. It's, we can do this in a couple of hours yeah. for someone like me. It's more than that. It's more like, well, what about this? What about this? As an anxious person, you just think of all the bad things instantly instead of like, oh, this is going to be simple. We can fix this right now. Right. You know, so for people, I just want to make sure that everyone can, can know that it, that it just was going to take a few more steps i think but and those steps are so my one two three are really four mm -hmm. five six because right, the, right. the one two three for you if you have anxiety is how to how to get to a place where you can put those other things into practice right and it's it's a lot of mental work mm -hmm. but you but are you unable to tell me what those other steps are because they're do you even know what they were for yourself See, I think it's different for each person, but for me, I would be like, well, what about if I want to snack? What if I just go take a nap? What if I actually go do yoga? What if I go take a walk? What if somebody needs me to come do this? What if I'm working that day? And what if I have this big um, project to do tonight? Like that is kind of where I'm coming from. So like the anxiety of everything else in life so with those steps. I see. So the anxiety gives you worry about endless things that mm -hmm. whatever you can imagine you're willing to worry about in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> like, like what if I have to paint my room in the middle of this while we're basal testing, then what's right. going to happen, Scott, obviously I'm going to die like, like that. Right. Like it feels right. that way. I see. Okay. Well, that's so like when you were saying that, obviously you're not going to go to that place, but my brain is just like, what about this? What about this? And it's not like a bad thing. I'm just saying it's, it's some people, I mean, I kind of struggle with that, you know? <laughs> no, I understand. I really do. I know people who have anxiety and mm -hmm. I've spoken to a lot of people on the podcast who've been depressed or anxious and, and I'm never not, uh, um, it, it's, it, it gives me a feeling of bewilderment because I don't have that mm -hmm. affliction, right? It's not happening to me. Right. You know, if you said to me, 
you know, Scott, later we're going to go downstairs and get in the car and drive away. I don't start thinking like, oh, I hope I don't fall on the steps or have a car accident mm-hmm. or something like that doesn't right. occur to me. Um, and it's, but yeah. it could and to it's others. kind of funny because that's, you're, you're kind of talking how my boyfriend explains things to me. So he's, we're like the yin and yang of that. So he has never struggled with anxiety and I'm over here like, what if, what if this happens? What do we do this? And then adding a long distance relationship on top of that. It's, it's just a funny thing to me. Well, and it's tough because if you're the person with anxiety, it is not as easy as just being told, don't be anxious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would be like if someone came up to you and said, Hey, just stop having cancer. It, do, you know, right. it, does, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And yet people who don't have anxiety can't fathom what's happening to you. Mm-hmm. I know it's for me, I'm, mesmerized and interested as you're talking because Mm -hmm. everything you're explaining is completely foreign to me i can't even put context to it (laughs) i just don't have i don't have that experience you know right and to help you like if you made it my empirical reason for being alive to help you not feel anxious i don't know what i would say to you you know what i mean like the only thing i can hope is that if you're blood sugars become more stable that'll be one less thing for you to be anxious about maybe that'll Mm -hmm. free up another break in the clouds for you to do something else you know right and that's that's why i say i think it's super important for people with diabetes even if you don't struggle with anxiety or depression or or any mental illnesses i think it's still super important to see a therapist to talk to somebody about it because it can be really stressful yeah can you Similarly to what I similar to what I just said, do you have trouble believing that some people just don't have anxiety? No, not at all. Okay. I I've seen it firsthand. Like my mom doesn't ever really share the same feelings as me in that sense, and neither does my boyfriend or my best friend even. So it's kind of interesting. But I've also learned from them in that way. Like they've helped me to be more carefree. Yeah, with so- things so. It's a good thing, I think, to be a part of communities that people are like me and then people that are like you, where we're just trying to learn from each other. Right. Again, a place where you can be aspirational. You can look up and mm-hmm. say, hey, they don't seem to be worried that the house is going to fall on yeah. them. Why is that happening? You, you right. know, right. Mm-hmm. And so what happens when you're around people who don't have anxiety? Do you just like, do you find whimsy? Do you just close your eyes and jump? Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you get to that? Like, how do they become impactful on you when they're not anxious something that has really helped me is grounding so i'll just like i'll look down at my feet like and i'll count my fingers or something silly like that and just think about where am i right now so i'll be at someone's house and i'm like well, why am i worrying about this thing that's a couple months away or just like you never know what you're gonna your brain is going to make you feel with anxiety sometimes. And so I like to look at them, see how their um, body language is. And I kind of just imitate that. And then for some reason, for me, it helps to just kind of act like them. And then I'm all of a sudden calm and it's just like, well, why was I worried in the first place? And before therapy, I never really would try anything like that. So I would just, it just was like a snowball effect. Yeah. So, so. you basically mm-hmm. fake it till you make it for your own brain. Exactly. You're, you're tricking your brain into being like, we're cool. We did it. It's all right. Don't worry. Right. And then it kind of lets go. Yeah. And it works for me and I'm sticking to that. Good and for you. that's kind of how I do with diabetes. Like this morning I woke up, my number was 207 and it's like, oh, okay, that's how my morning's going to go. But it's really, it's not a problem. Like I can bolus for my breakfast, check my number right after, keep up with it, and it didn't turn into anything other than that, you know? So that's exciting. That mm-hmm. really is exciting for you. I'm glad. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. I I mean that's how it's the only way to do this thing, right? Is you have to have a short mm-hmm. memory. Like having diabetes is like being a pitcher. You can't <laughs> you can't give up a home run and then turn back to the next batter and think, I'm gonna give up a home run again. This is what's gonna mm-hmm. happen. I suck at this. This is gonna go poor. You just have to forget it and move on. And it, it really is, um, it's one of the steps, I think, of of coming to terms with diabetes is you really do have to come to terms with this is what it is. It's always going to be this, not every day maybe, but sometimes. And I have to be flexible 
so that when it does pop up, I don't get mired down in it. I just fix it and move on. And that's it. Yes. Yeah. Good for you. Wow. I, I think you're a really strong person. It's a, uh, a lot of extra work that, that, you know, some people don't have to do that you're having to do. And, um, it's very cool that you didn't give up. It's really great that you saw something and, and kind of ran, to, ran towards it. I'm, uh, I'm very proud of you and I've only known you for like an hour. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. And your episode's going to be called break in the clouds. Oh, that's awesome. Isn't that nice. That's beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Oh, no yeah. one's ever said that before. Once I got yelled at, uh, I was oh, like, gosh. Hey, I'm going to call your episode this. She's like, no, you're not. I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. I won't. Oh, I was, no. <laughs> it's like, it's well, very, very easy to push me around. <laughs> when you mentioned, um, pictures and, and home runs and things it reminded me, I played softball in high school for two years and in two years I probably had about 40 juice boxes and so my softball coach called me juice box which is kind of funny that I'm on the juice box <laughs> podcast <laughs> juice box get into the field you're playing second <laughs> yeah I would be in the dugout with the Capri Sun before the next inning was up and it was just I don't know it, I was a mess <laughs> <laughs> well listen I think there's a world where you could go play softball again and your blood sugar wouldn't get low while you were playing absolutely yeah and that world just for clarity is uh built on a great basal rate pre bolusing your meals and understanding mm -hmm. your food mm -hmm. that's it I am dying to hear back from you so well I will keep in touch yeah I want to know how this goes I really do um, yeah, I'm really excited to this year has definitely been crazy is a good word to describe it yeah. for everybody, but it's been kind of the best year for me. So let's let's end with that, because I agree with you that this might have been good for a lot of people. So taking a lot of the variables out of your life mm -hmm. for the lockdown gave you more bandwidth to look at the things you needed to look at. Is that about right? That's right. It's yeah. definitely kind of the. Not really a break, but definitely a a break from unnecessary stresses in my life. And I was really able to reconnect with myself. I know that's cheesy, but it's true. And being able to have the job that I have and be able to go to school online and take care of myself, it's been wonderful. You just made some space for you to operate in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So between the anxiety the diabetes and the rat race of life, you were just, you were, you were inside like a snow globe and somebody was just constantly shaking it. But now somebody put the snow globe down and you're able to focus on what's around you and, and the snow's kind of falling, everything's still. And you're like, okay, I can take care of my blood sugar better then I can do this. And then you just needed more time. You needed a slower launch mm -hmm. to me. Like, and I really do think that's what it is. And it's what you said earlier, right? Like you just, there's more steps for you to get to something. And while the whole, right. re, while everyone else is racing forward, you'd prefer to walk forward because it's going to take you a little longer to step over the roadblocks in front of you. But then once you get over those blocks, you're good. As long as you don't get into a group of more than five people. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really great way to think about it. And yeah. I don't think there's really anything wrong with that. Recognizing no. it and making the change are you kidding that's what's important there's nothing wrong with whatever anyone needs to do to get <laughs> to get through their thing you know yeah. like because everybody has something and you know you just need to make adjustments like the world's not like the way the world looks makes everybody feel like there are rules like this is what i'm supposed to do this is what i have to do this is the time frame i need to accomplish these things and and if i'm not making a certain amount of money or don't get to this point in a certain amount of time this whole thing's an abject failure and i'm going to die penniless and alone that's how yep. everybody thinks about life and you really shouldn't there's a billion things going on around you you can just find the spot where you fit and settle into it and i think that's just the best way to think about it yeah. I've become a real optimist this over this pandemic, which is, it's kind of ironic, you know, but I really agree. I think yeah. there's a place for everybody. Just, yeah, there really mm -hmm. is. And if you're trying to jam yourself into a spot, you don't fit, you really should stop doing that. Right. You know, it really is a, it's just a fool's errand to make yourself into something that you're not. Mm -hmm. So you are delightful, Sarah. I really appreciate you doing this. 
Thank you. I, I'm so glad that I was able to come on. And if I can reach just one person struggling kind of the same way I was, I mean, that's so worth it to me. You're going to reach a lot more than one person. So um, <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing your story. I, was it easy for you to talk about yourself or did, did you find this troubling? So I reached out to you maybe in June or July. I can't even remember. Mm -hmm. And you telling me December, I was like, oh, that's going to be great, whatever. Didn't think about it for a couple months. Anxiety rolls around when I get the reminder one week away, you have a Zoom with with Scott. And I'm like, oh, gosh, what am I going to even talk about? But it's always like so worth it after I do a big thing like this or, you know, it's kind of like the stage fright of a project in school yeah. in that way. Yeah. I mean, it was not hard to talk about myself because I reminded myself that some other people might be feeling the same way. Yeah. Well, you did great and they definitely are feeling the same way. So it's very Thank valuable you. for you to talk about it. Do I have to put this right out or are you going to, are you not going to freak out if it takes a little while for it to go up? Oh no, no. Yeah, look at I you. just think this was a really cool experience for me. I'm glad. I really am. Huge thanks to Sarah for coming on the show and sharing her story. Don't forget, there's going to be a little update from Sarah in a second. I also want to thank Omnipod, makers of the Omnipod Dash and makers of the Omnipod Promise for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Of course, also... To be thanked today, the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. You can find out more about that meter at contournext.com forward slash juice box. And the Omnipod is available to you at omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Head over and find out more. I reached out to Sarah to get an update, and here's what she said. I graduated with my associate's degree in early childhood education this May. I also earned certifications in children's education, career studies, and early childhood development. I was inspired to become a diabetic educator, but realized that teaching young children is my true passion. Just this week, I was offered a lead teaching position in a Montessori preschool. She's very excited. But she still wants to continue to spread awareness for type 1 diabetes outside of her career. She also says that there's always room for improvement, but my diabetes management has gotten better and my A1C is getting better. It's now at 6.4. She's super excited to be vaccinated and getting back out into the world and meeting her friends. And she was excited to come on the podcast. Thank you so much, Sarah. I was excited for having you. I am super sorry that I lost the minutes at the beginning where we were getting to know each other. I want to thank everyone for listening and let you know that I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox podcast.